Hello, and welcome to ALBW Live. I'm Pat Eskate. I am the organizer of Ann Lister Birthday Week, cheesy promo, which will be held in Halifax the week of July 11th through the 18th in 2021. And I hope you'll join us there. But in the meantime, we're bringing a number of the speakers that we might normally be talking to at that time as a little appetizer to the event. And today, uh, we are very fortunate to have with us a member of the Gentleman Jack team. But before I introduce him, I want to take just a second to thank my team. Um, I do try to do this each and every time. Uh, Livia Labade, Steph Galloway, uh, now Cheryl McDonald's in the background as well. And uh, But this week, I want to give a special thank you to Stephanie because she has put together some just dynamite graphics, et cetera, and I, I can't be happier with the work that she's done. So without further ado, let's welcome Matt Gray, the Director of Photographer for Gentleman Jack. Hello, Hello. Matt. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, good, good. How are things over in England? Um, I think they're settling down. I think we're getting uh, sort of got it under control. Um, strange kind of new normal that we're in. Yes. And uh, yeah, so yeah. Ho hopefully yeah. it's going okay for everybody else who's uh, tuned in. Well, we're certainly working on that. And um, what I'd like to do, uh, Matt, is start off our interview with just with a little bit of background. There were some things that you talked to me about, about the kinds of lenses that you use and those kinds of things, just some general information about you as the director of photography, uh, photography, et cetera. And then we're gonna move into Gentleman Jack specifically. So my first question to you is, um, you are the director of photography for season one of Gentleman Jack, um, but I know that you, you actually handled the camera work for, I think it's episodes one and two and seven and eight. We had different- That's right. So there were different camera people other than that. How do you go about selecting them? And are you still overseeing it at that point? How does that work? Yeah, so I was lucky to be involved with the ones that uh, Sally directed, uh, Sally Wainwright, who obviously I was a big fan of her work and she's an incredible writer. So I was able to um, be involved with the project. And um, yeah, so Nick Dance did um, the second block and Simon Chapman did the third block. And then we came back again to do the final block. Um, it, you know, there's so much involved and so much, so, so many logistics involved. Um, and the last block obviously moved. Um, we moved out to Copenhagen for oh, some right. of it. So there was some some reckies, um, quite involved reckies out there. So um, yeah, so it was it, 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 both Nick and Simon did a fantastic job um, picking up really from the style that we'd established, um, which took a you know a long time to to work through. Uh, and Sally had some really strong ideas which we were uh, keen to support, and really wonderful ideas. You know, such right. a, an interesting project. Before we get to some of the details on Sally's vision and how you mm -hmm. uh, how you met that vision. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the cameras in in detail, or a little bit specifics about that. You're using Steadicams, you're using the boom-mounted uh, cameras, you've got all sorts of things going on, um, depending on the shot. And you shared with me that uh, part of what you do in filming is you choose particular types of lenses, depending on the shot that you're going to use. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Well, part of the early, early prep is to try and establish what the look and the tone of, um, of any project is. Um, and we talked a lot about this particular project having in, uh, dynamism and energy and vitality, which obviously um, is, um, you know, similar to um, our, you know, Gentleman Jack, our main character. Um, and it was... Um, so, so we had these different rhythms going on because it's also a love story. Oh. Um, so we chose to shoot with the Alexa minis, um, which are, are wonderful digital cameras. And then in, we tested a number of different lenses and, in, and each different types of lenses have different personalities. Um, so, you know, you want to try and test different types. Um, you know, some are quite clean and, you know, quite technically perfect others are softer and have got you know different impurities to them um, 
we settled on the uh, Cook lenses, uh, which is a British manufacturer, and we it was set it up as an anamorphic shoot. So we used um, the Cook anamorphic, modern Cook anamorphic lenses. Um, but then for the more romantic elements and the love story, we used older spherical rehoused Cook speed pancros, which are 1930s and to 50s lenses, which have been rehoused to work with the kind of modern modern cameras. Wow. Um, so and, and each each one of those lenses, each different types of lenses give it a different look and a different feel. Right. I, I remember yeah. from from years ago in my film studies class, I'm talking about how they used to put Vaseline on the on some of the lenses to soften the look back in the 30s and 40s, etc. But I guess you don't have to do that now if you've got uh, lenses that already have some age to it. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're looking for anything that's going to help take a little bit of the digital edge off them. And one of the wonderful things about these new cameras is not only their resolution is higher, but obviously their latitude is higher. And so you're able to get a, a good kind of digital negative. Um, and then there's a process that you go through with the colorist. Um, and Kevin Horsford in, in, uh, down at Technicolor did a wonderful job. And uh, Ollie, our DIT, um, you know, is applying these looks and these different um, textures to it. So, so let's talk just a little bit about that because you did mention the term colorist when you and I did our pre-interview. And this is something that's relatively new to the advent of digital photography, correct? Or am I wrong? Yes, I mean, a, a colorist, um, you know, they bring so much to a project and, um, because what you're delivering is a digital negative, which is quite flat because it can it, it keeps the highlights and it keeps the shadow detail, but then you've got to apply a look to it. So in the way you might Photoshop a, a still image, um, a colorist will be effectively using those similar tools to each one of our shots. And to give you an example of this one, we were keen to have, for it to be, um, to, to have colour to it, not to not to be garish, but it, you know, not for it not to be desaturated. Um, and then we also wanted to, you know, for the blacks not to go to a solid dark black. So we wound in a little bit of magenta, um, which gave this kind of wonderful, these wonderful magenta hues in the in the lower register. Um, and you know, Kevin did a fantastic job at finding that and playing with it and. Um, making sure that it was there, but it wasn't, uh, you know, um, over being overbearing. And then you, you're still wanting to protect your your flesh tones and all the other wonderful colours that the that um, you know the, the costumes, Tom's wonderful costumes that were there. Um, right. So so while you're so in your role as director of photography, and when you're thinking about how you're going to shoot this, you have yeah. all other stuff that's going on as far as using the colorist and the kinds of lenses and all the rest of that it isn't just standing behind a, a, a camera anymore. no no it's it's kind of helping to you know pull everybody's vision to bear you know I mean, a project like this you know starts as uh, you know sally you know sally was conceiving this you know years and years ago and yes. and, um, and and worked on this you know wonderful project and honing this um real world script um and then it goes out and it gets funded you know and you know lookout point did a wonderful job of steering it and bring it to um fruition so that and then you've got people like you know anna pritchard the designers doing all her work and right. uh you know everybody's doing their work and and then on the day you know you're you're hoping to try and kind of steer that in towards the the vision that we've all um discussed you know? wow so, yeah on that day it all falls into your lap doesn't that's it that's right yeah, yeah. Woo. <laughs> no, no pressure right uh, not, not at all yeah. now you had now you've been taught you've mentioned a couple of times now and we had talked about the fact that that um sally had a particular vision for it i want to ask you a question before we get to that vision when you first get the script and you're deciding whether or not this is a project that you want to be involved in, when you first got the Gentleman Jack script, what did you see in your head? What was the, what was your first take on this? Well, firstly, I was kind of blown away by the script because the script, you know, Sally's writing is so, is so good. You know, when you, when you read lots of scripts and then you get, a, you know, one of Sally's scripts through because it's so economical, 
she manages to you know tell tell the story and bring all these wonderful characters to life but she also manages to reference things which are beyond the script kind of off the canvas as it were you know themes which are bigger than just the story um and and it's a really interesting period in 1832 you know queen victoria's not on the throne um you know the country's urbanizing you know, people are coming out of the countryside into these early cities um, and so there's a real energy and vitality going on in the countryside whilst also you know the kind of rural um, pace as well changing mm. um, so you've got these different thrusts and energies and so that got, kind of comes off the page and then you've got this incredible character and Lister and you, you're just thinking how do I not know about this character you know she's right. such a really interesting person you know and that was that was something that Sally talked a lot about that she wanted it to be you know a popular piece that would you know let the world know about Anne um, right. because she's an incredible woman and incredible energy um, so so you know when I'm reading that that, that you just think rather well, this is great to be involved in and also period wise you know I've done a lot of period dramas over the years but I've always tended to enjoy um, you know just the personal taste going towards ones that have got a sense of um, modernity in a way they're talking about you know modern subjects right or uh, but with the lens with the lens of uh, a, a period uh, right drama. It, it's so interesting how you know we talk about themes in in anything books movies whatever and the themes are as old as time you know nothing's really changed what we're talking about it's just yeah. also the lens of those particular eras yeah. um so so you've got this vision from sally uh Let's talk a little bit about one of the things that you shared with me was that you, Sally wanted Anne to come off as modern and dynamic. So you, yeah. as the director of photography, how does that frame itself in your head? What are you looking to do? Well, when I, when I join a project, you know, I tend to try and do a lot of listening early on, you know, because you're trying to catch up, you, you, you're picking up speed, you're trying to catch up with everybody and you know you do uh, try and do a lot of listening and, and and distilling the brief in a way um and so that by the time you you've got the brief and the the creative choices that are available to you so there was two there's two different energies really there's 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 um you know Anne's energy as wonderfully you know um portrayed with by saran you've got that Kind of energy and thrust but then you've got the the love story um and so you, you've got these two different energies um and really it's, it's interesting when you look at the first the first opening sequence actually which is one of the um series of sequences where we're laying our stall out you know the camera starts on a uh, period view of of um, halifax you know 1832 and then you come across this this carriage and then the camera goes with the carriage and and then you, you're right behind it um and then it cuts ahead and you've got this historical view of a of a family with a cart you know and then you cut ahead again and you're inside a carriage and you're getting the moments of exposition you're introducing one of your characters who you're going to be um going through the story with Anne walker um, right she's also telling you some story about Shibden. Um, and then you're back with the the, um, the guy in the carriage, uh, fast carriage, which Sally always described as uh, you know somebody in a equivalent of a Porsche, you know, um, <laughs> boy 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 racing through this scene. And then you're into one of your early set pieces, uh, which has got kind of dynamism, which then motivates you into Shibden Hall. You know, this kind of collision of storylines. Yes, uh, yes. Well, it's a wonderful piece of writing, and so really when you're when you when you're looking at something like that you're just trying to make sure that you can serve that and just you know describe those different moments you know right right and you and you also spoke of and we're going to get to that um we're going to get to the entry scene of the hero in just a minute yeah. but you shared some information with me about things that you do with your camera in terms of of uh capturing Ann Lister as the hero, just on a general basis, things like shooting, I think it was below the eye line and 
Well, we tried to, you know, she is the hero of the story and uh, we, we shot her as a, as a hero um, in all those kind of classic ways of giving her the kind of hero shots, you know, so we would tend to, you know, she would occupy the frame very strongly. Uh, we'd be tended to be kind of close and, you know, you'd be pushing in under her or just slightly below the eye line you know, and use all those kind of techniques which are used for, you know, people like James Bond or whatever, you know, those kind of kind of heroic frames. And that was definitely one of our, one of our uh, um, tonal um, styles that we wanted to use. Um, yeah. And, you know, so, so, so you, you think about that first sequence, you, you end up at Shipton Hall, it's all very, very dramatic. And then you've got a, a kind of, chamber piece there with, with lots of characters and, and right. lots of character coming right. out and, and classic um, Sally characters you know really rich and really dense um, and lots of dialogue going on alluding to a character who hasn't arrived yet and then you're right. into the title sequence which we talked um, a lot about on and off through the, through the course of the shooting about how the title sequence might give you a, a bit of a a taster of the the hero who was to come uh, and yeah. then you come out of the titles and you're into the um arrival you know and um and listeners arrival on screen you know right so. oh wait i forgot to put this on the list and i did want to mention it because it's been a subject of much discussion in general gentleman jack fandom is it saran jones in the title sequence putting on her clothing Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely. We were shooting that at high speed, and with high speed, you know, you need a lot of light to get an exposure. Uh, I can't remember what the frame rate frame rate was, but it was probably at least a hundred frames. And um, so she was, she was, you know, she was under a lot of light there. Um, yeah. So yeah, she it was definitely her. It was definitely it's her. A, it, it, it really is a great sequence, and it really. Um, as a first time viewer, you know, when I first watched it, just that, that, that sequence alone was like, whoa, that ca captures your attention. But then comes her entry into Halifax and into the, into the program. And I have to tell you that when, that when that coach came racing down the street and she leapt off that seat onto the ground, my first thought was, that's the best hero entrance I've ever seen. I loved that scene. Yeah, and it's, a great, it's a great sequence. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about who was driving it, you know, what it took to do it, um, that whole... Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting to look at that sequence because um, it just involves so many people, you know. Um, you know, filmmaking is like trying to paint a picture with 60 hands on the paintbrush, you know, it really is a collaborative human endeavor. And, you know, that sequence is, is, is a case in point, you know, um, I mean, Webster did a really good job of finding that location. Um, and, but, you know, it wasn't perfect. The buildings um, were slightly later, um, kind of early Victorian. Um, and, um, or kind of 1880 from mid Victorian. Yes, but, yeah. um, you know, it was a great cobbled street, um, and but Sally was keen, quite rightly, to suggest that this was a a, a, a growing town, and beyond it um, were the fields still. You know, so we had great big green screens at either end, and Gary Brown and his wonderful uh, team at Technicolor extended the street as and and and, and Sally Pritchard and the, and the design team did an incredible job of you know, um, trying to bring the street alive, the period it was. Um, and then Gary, Gary's team increased and, and did some set construction above that in, through VFX. Um, and then you've got, you know, hundreds of people on the day, you know, you've got, um, um, you know, all the costume makeup team who are up early to do, put everybody, all the extras through it. Nice. Um, and then you've got the um, Devil, Devil's Horsemen were the people who did all the um, horses oh, and wow. the carriages and they did an amazing job. Um, and so you, you just, there's just so much, you know, and it's all corralled by a wonderful first AD, Nathan, and, you know, it's, it's all brought together. And then, oh, you know, and then for, the, for the, those moments, um, you know, there that's you what we're all there for, you know, that's all the, 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 all the writing and the money is being spent for those moments with the cameras turning 
yeah. you're just capturing those those little moments you know and everybody's performing and you know for those how little ex- moments how exciting when you're be- when you're behind the lens when you're seeing this in your camera do you know when when you've got the perfect shot Yes, I mean the the the, the key there on, a, on on days like that when you've got lots of resources um, is just try and keep focused. Um, and you, you know you've got your notes and there's there's, there's a very clear day uh, that you're following. Um, and um, yeah, I mean to be honest with you, time very often dictates it. You know because because right. you know you've only got so much time. Right. Um, but that's what you do feel for directors and particularly Sally in this instance because you know. Um, put so much energy and effort into these scenes and then you she, she might have six takes uh, if she's lucky you know. right um, so uh, Sally shared with us at some point I could have been in a conversation with me or may have been in the interview that we did with her but there there was there's that moment and you did wind up using this take where the carriage is coming around the corner and the wheel hits the curb and the whole thing starts to kind of tilt we, yeah. Did it feel like the thing was about to fall over to you? Well, I think it's one of those on the lens. It looked really precarious, you know. Um, I, I'm sure. I mean, the 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 the, um, the woman who was actually driving the carriage, who was the stunt double, who was dressed like um, um, Saran, um, was uh, you know a championship um, team horse. Uh, oh, wow. rider you know I mean she was amazing and she had to get a lot of speed up very quickly so that the courage looked like it was traveling and then the road ran out you know so then she's like you know pulling <laughs> it up and of course we're in the back in this thing called the Russian arm which you saw the image of uh, so we're in a fast <laughs> fast car I got Martin my focus puller in the boot Sally's next to me with a monitor there's the stunt driver of the car there's the crane operator in the passenger seat I'm behind with a remote and you know and you know it's you know who wouldn't want to be traveling in a fast car down a period street with actually you know extras dressed you know it's just great fun wow you know, it, it, it's great fun i mean you know there's moments of Sally and I kind of looking at each other we we're having a great day then you know? yeah, it's going God. well it was a great day you know? oh it just said i mean the whole thing sounds like a tremendous amount of fun and yeah. uh and of course the- within that you know within that as well you know saran has got to get off that carriage and you know she's obviously aware that this is a you know her first scene um we've done a number of scenes with her before that which was great so she was you know she fully inhabited the character which was right. brilliant to see and so when she got off that it, it was great there was a, there was definitely a moment um john hember our steady cam operator you know kind of pushed in on her and, 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 she, and, and she got that look where she turns to the gentleman it was great really. oh she's just fantastic i mean yeah. If she doesn't get the BAFTA next week, exactly, exactly, it's going to be such a shame. You put so much energy into that, you know. Yeah. It's such a, it was so yeah, on, a, on a daily basis, it was such a joy to to watch. That's one of the great things about because uh, I light and I also operate um, the A camera, um, um, and it's just wonderful seeing the, the performance on a daily basis. Oh, I, I can imagine. Uh, you know, the energy must have a specific feel to it. Um, we are going to do the reunion scene um, <clears throat> a little further on here, but on the day of the wedding scene, was that sh- was the wedding scene shot in sequence, or was that uh, was that shot much earlier? No, that was shot. That was shot in our block, so that was quite you know obviously late in the, the shooting period. Yeah. So um, so yeah, that was that was a great great sequence yeah. we had we had somebody who um the, uh, leanne mertzman who uh, is one of the women that does this shibden after dark podcast who wrote to me earlier this morning and had a very specific question about that scene uh, or the final scene if there was a different sort of energy on the set that you had reached the penultimate scene really of the program where ann ann lister gets her girl right yeah yeah. And, and we know that we've reached the end of the series. How did that feel on set when you got to that point? Do you mean the, the, the hilltop sequence? Not the hilltop. No, I'm talking no, the, about the, the, the wedding sequence. The, the wedding sequence, yeah. Um, well, that was a really, really important sequence because obviously, um, you know, to actually shoot in that church, the, the, yeah. the church where it really happened was really 
but you know practically it's a very very old space and uh, not much light and I seem to remember think uh, you know on a practical level I think we lost the light at about four o'clock so we, you know the, the, it's kind of ringed with lights to try and maintain a, a sense of daylight in, in, in the place. So those, it's a bit like Shibden, those places they, they've got so much history to them it just comes out in the walls you know so you feel very honoured to be in those original spaces um, right. telling a telling a drama or something that happened there it's yeah it, it's very it gives it a very interesting energy definitely. yes yeah it's it, i'm glad you've frozen there pat matt we're back sorry right. good That's i wasn't sure i was, I was going to start juggling or something i just kind of uh no. frozen no, that was the, that's the first time that's actually happened to us in all the ALBW lives that we've done. Okay. But, you know, as all of this goes on, there's more and more use of the internet and yeah. it's really frosty now and then. So, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit. We've talked about, um, we've talked about how you shot Ann Lister as the hero. I'm yeah. curious as to how, what were your thoughts as you shot um, Ann Walker? Sophie Rundle is Ann Walker. What what kinds of stylistic changes did you make with her? Well, um, Ann Walker is much more of a formal approach. Um, Sally referenced some wonderful formal paintings for us there, hmm. um, and it's you know she's obviously in a gilded cage, and um, so that gave us the opportunity to kind of step back, and see her in the in a very classical environment uh, and kind of quite classical compositions. Um, and, um, and then gradually through the story, we use more handheld with her, um, particularly in the, in the emotional moments uh, and, and, and the, um, you know, the, the relationship moments. So um, yeah, it was great. It was nice to have those different textures and also the different locations you know so shouldn't hold very much a, a family um, a family house um, and it's got lots of energy and dynamism and then you go and it's like all this money and this wealth you know with them and you had some technical challenges with that as well right because Shibden Hall which Shibden Hall is very dark yes so you were ringing the place with light but Sutton Park, on the other hand, which was the stand-in for Crow's Nest, has those gigantic windows. So yeah. that had to have its own particular challenges as you were. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of those houses, you know, the state rooms, the kind of wealth um, presenting rooms tended to be on the south side. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that means that you've got the, the sun is moving around and you've got the, and it was this wonderful vista which was great, but it did mean that the sun, one minute was there, the next minute it wasn't. So you, within slightly longer scenes, you're trying to replicate that. Right. Um, so that's a, that was a bit of a challenge. We, we, we got through it. And um, I suppose in the ideal world, you might have chosen a north facing side of the building, but you know, the, north, the, the, the rooms in the north side um, weren't as well appointed, shall we say. Oh, right, and I'm sure they were probably smaller too. Uh, yeah, a little bit smaller. Um, yeah. Um, but those, uh, but yeah, it was, it was it was a great location. Right. A uh, question for you: um, When Anne goes up to Scotland, uh, was that shot on a set, or were you using? Were you in Scotland? What were you? What 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 was that about? No, we didn't go to Scotland. That was another location locally, um, and then again, Gary Brown and his team did the um, the VFX. Right. Um, so that moment where. Um, Sophie Rundle, as uh, Anne Walker, is looking out over the sea. She's you know, facing a green screen, and then they did their magic. Ah. Um, so you know, we didn't actually uh, go to Scotland, no. Yeah, and just uh, for our viewers, uh, we are going to be talking with Gary Brown at some point. So if you're really interested in that, in the, that side of the technology, um, I've, I've had a chance to see an interview with him, and it really is fascinating. So when you see Gary Brown, pop up on the list, do please join us. Yeah, he's a really fascinating guy. He's really fascinating. Let's, um, talking about sets versus on location, uh, I do know that um, obviously a good portion of it was shot in Shibden Hall. Some things had to be moved to a set and study was a set 
elsewhere, and we'll cover that in detail with Anna. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the carriages and the shots in the carriages. And we do have an image of that that Steph is going to put up for us. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. That's the image that you sent to us. And you told me that there were two different background screens and a number of other things. So tell yeah. us. About um, so that, that image that uh, I sent you was, um, I'm pretty sure it was Aaron Walker's carriage. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the art department did a really good job of replicating the interior. I think it was Richard, the art, art director, who did it. Um, so once they'd chosen what the, the actual interior, the fabrics um, were going to be, then they did them in the real carriages and then also did them in our little mock carriages. And that's on a kind of suspended bungee suspension rig you know and then outside is green screen and then gary does his work in terms of you know putting what it is they look outside and we've got moving lights to suggest a sense of of movement and we did actually look at the the real world carriages but they were so they were so small and by the time you've got a, a, a lens you know the, the lens wasn't very far away from the actor's nose and it, it was just a little bit too restrictive. Whereas this allowed us to to take it to a, a, a location where we had some time in the schedule and we could we could operate it. Um, the the um, the later um, Copenhagen journey, um, that was a different carriage and that was in the studio. That, um, just for the, the, our audience, uh, when you finally make it to Shibden Hall, if you haven't been there yet, um, the, the actual Lister carriage is out in the barn, and you'll be stunned to see how small this thing is. I mean, everybody must have been a lot tinier than we are now, but yeah. really interesting. Um, you mentioned Copenhagen. You and I did not talk about this beforehand, but somebody did ask a question about that. Um, what was that, uh, in that particular sequence of Anne um, arriving, cutting through the crowds, and then the whole, you know, dance, et cetera, what was it, what does it take to, to block that out, to actually be able to follow or her th through those crowds? That's all Steadicam, right? That is, yeah, and um, Gareth Hughes did a, a, a wonderful job to Steadicam on that. I mean, he just did it so many times, and it was a wonderful Piece. we actually found that location having traveled around Copenhagen and seeing some incredible locations if anybody gets an opportunity to travel to Copenhagen is amazing but they just we just couldn't make them work um, because they were they were quite a journey away from Copenhagen Center and we've been using a lot of our time just traveling to some of these locations so we ended up finding that it was uh, Liverpool Town Hall um, oh wow. and yeah so um, you know the the town halls of the um, Victorian era are, are really quite extraordinary, and that Liverpool town hall is is really exceptional. And um, so that was all. Uh, Gareth did a, a wonderful job, and and we did it in one take. Actually, it worked really really well in one take. Actually, as as one piece. Wow. And, you know, goes in, and then there's a, a moment of dialogue when she's she she joins the the main room and then goes on to the dance floor i mean actually gareth um and saran did that you know as one take wow. um, and then we did the just the posing of just seeing her coming in uh, and that was then cut in but the actual original was done as a single take which i always loved that so Oh, that's amazing. I mean, I, I don't know how many people that are watching realize how the difficulty of doing something like that. And there are some historically amazing long take shots, like in the beginning of the movie, The Player. Um, it goes on for, I don't know, five minutes in one take. So it's not any small thing that you did. No, there. not at all. I mean, um, you know, it was a, it was a really really good shot as I say Gareth did a great job and um, I think it was in the cut as a single shot for a while and then I think maybe I don't know maybe pace you know pace and time and those kind of things it was uh, it was cut into and the sequence works really really well anyway you know it does so, yeah. Yeah. yeah um before we move into our next uh, area which is the reunion scene I wanted to ask you about a term that you used in our uh, earlier conversation. You were talking about the emotional distance of the camera. Can you explain that, please? I think so. I think 
it's something that I tend to use. It's really how you describe, um, in a way, where the audience are going to be experiencing the story from. You know, so sometimes it might be that you're on longer lenses, and there's always something between you and the character, and it feels more observed. Um, but uh, this one, we felt, you know, you want to be right, you know, front row seat, um, experiencing um, Anne Lister's st story and journey. You know. Right. So once you begin to, you know, after many, many discussions with, um, with Sally and the team, you know, you begin to develop a, a sense of, you know, where are we going to be in terms of telling this story? Um, and that's what I describe as an emotional distance, you know, and sometimes it can be really very intimate. So in, in, in the intimate moments, um, in the handheld sequences, we come, we, we come in really very, very close and we're, we're, we're not seeing these kisses from the other side of the room, you know, right. we are experiencing them and it becomes very experiential. Um, and uh, so once you've established that, um, then it's just a case of just making sure you're maintaining that and, and, and you're not necessarily jumping around, you know, all, you know, you're not going between a long lens and a you know, wide close lens right. try, and try and maintain if possible unless that's unless that is your um, creative choice to actually play with that emotional distance and, 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 and shake it up a little bit right jump so, back in and out right right yeah, yeah. I, I i know that you were not uh on cam on, on the camera on the day of in season five when um ann is in bed with ann walker and she talks about uh that she realizes what people think of her and that she rises above it and that that's just the way she's had to live her life but um yeah i don't think i did i mean i did some additional photography on the other blocks but i don't think i did that sequence yeah yeah that was really uh really wonderfully done sequence so that you know the member of your team who shot that bravo by the way mm. but let's yeah. get to let's get to one that i know that everybody out there is waiting for and that's the reunion scene yeah and um, you mentioned to me in an earlier interview that one of the challenges in that scene is that there's so the, the emotional gears change so often in that it's about three and a half minutes long, I think, in that first or maybe close to five. So talk a little bit about that, about how you as a camera person have to be able to capture all that. Yeah, that sequence obviously was um, on the hilltop, which took a bit of time to find, but Luke did a really good job in finding it. And it just, you know, remember when we went there first time, we just, it, you know, it fell away and there wasn't much VFX cleanup needed there. So that was, that, you know, it ticked a lot of boxes. And um, so obviously Saran is, she's got that journey where she's, you know, everything has, has, has appears to have fallen apart, you know. And I think the approach sequence of, uh, of Anne, of Van Walker was longer. There was a sequence I remember shooting, um, you know, through through a wood um, at the back of uh, Shifton. So that was uh, initially was a little bit longer. So you mm. you you were with um, uh, Anne Lister, and then you were with Anne Walker approaching. So and that worked really really well. The way it is now, it's, it's sharper and, and and it probably works better, as to be honest with you. But um, it was um, you've got Anne Walker's. Uh, uh, approach and that was on Steadicam and obviously then they come together and it was um, from memory Sally did lots of uh, you know she'd already done pre-rehearsals she did, took her time with it and obviously we did it initially on the crane which took a bit of time to set up but that allowed us to do the final moments um, and then we did it handheld um, and I'm on a I'm on a box um, alongside and you know filming you know, very, very close with the handheld where Martin, my focus call is at a distance is um, remotely doing the focus. And, and, and so actually it feels quite intimate. So you're on this hilltop, um, there's Sophie and there's Saran and there's, there's me and, you know, uh, you know, we're physically kind of working it together there. And obviously um, Sally's directing it. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it was a, it's tough. There's, those sequences are tough for the actors because, you know, they're, they're They've got to bring themselves to a particular point and um and uh, you know you've got to give them the space to allow them to find that emotion uh it's great it's really good it's a good sequence i have uh several people that have been involved with that 
really bringing it to that, which it really is a wonderful thought. Uh, really quite something. Yeah, you just broke up there, Pat. I didn't quite catch that last phrase, sorry. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know why we're having so much trouble today, but my, my comment was that um, people had, several people that we've talked to talked about how the actresses were really on, on fire that day. Oh, they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely on fire, yeah. What's it like, um, what's it like for you as the cameraman to be in the midst of that when, when you recognize that you've got these two people that are totally tuned in to who they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing? Does that raise a level of energy in you as well? Oh, absolutely, because you feel enormously privileged. Um, and also what you're trying to do is allow them space to capture that without, you know, the technicalities of, of filmmaking getting in the way. Um, and so, and, and the, there's definitely a point, you know, I've done many, many sequences similar over the years. And there's a point where you can see that they, they, you don't exist and the camera doesn't exist and the sound recordist doesn't exist and, and they're in the moment. You know, wow. and um, and that you know the, that you can see that rising, uh, and, and then that might exist for you know two or three takes, and then it might ebb away. You know, and, uh, and so it feel you feel very privileged, and obviously it just it means you you've got to be alive to the moment and make sure that you don't you don't get anything wrong. You know, because right. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know, my folks will always try to make sure that, you know at that crucial moment everything's sharp and focused and you know and right. we got we got very lucky there because um the weather was pretty consistent i mean you know for those astute would see that actually the, the sun moves around uh the scene uh and so we're um you know um, paul jarvis my gaffer and the electrical team are you know trying to kind of manage all the the fill light just to make sure it, it so it looks from a lighting continuity point of view, like it's only existing within a few minutes, but wow. actually the, the lights actually travel around through the course of the day, but it was pretty consistent. You know, it really is, it's astounding to me, um, and not just in Gentleman Jack, but certainly because I have a strong attachment to it, uh, that whole concept of the fact that there are cameras that, you know, and there's electricians and there's all sorts of people on set as all of this is happening. and. Boy, what a what a pain to the uh, ability of of the actors and actresses that are are involved in those scenes that they just block that out and go really yeah, absolutely. stunning. Absolutely. Uh, I want to make sure that we've hit most of the things that you and I were going to talk about, and we have. I'm happy to say. Great. And so we're going to move into uh, accepting some questions from the audience now. And I, um, I have them coming up on my screen. Okay, great, great. So I'm not ignoring you and I'm not checking my email. I'm actually looking for what they want to know. All right, so uh, this first one is um, from Leanne Mertzman. The fourth wall breaks were iconic in this show. Was it, it, was it exciting as a cinematographer to be setting up shots where your actor was going to look directly at the camera and did it affect the way you approached those shots? Um, I'm not sure it affected the way we approached it. I mean, you know, they, they were wound into the script, so they were very exciting, just, you know, right, right from the word go reading it, um, which I, I, I loved that. And it felt a very modern thing to do, um, but then equally it, it was, it had integrity to it, which is another kind of key word that we work towards, you know, in, in, you know, having integrity, which is something that's really important to Sally, you know, some kind of truth to it. And I think because it was a diary, um, and this story was, you know, has, has come through somebody's words, the ability of the main actor to, to, to look you in the eye, um, it, that felt quite truthful, actually. That felt like a diary moment. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it, it was a, a technique that worked really, really well. As in, you know, when, when you saw it happen the first time, it does catch you. Right. You know, even, even operating, because that's actually something that you, as an operator, you're looking out for. Anybody who might just 
catch the catch the lens right um but it does give it gives it a certain power and then sets up this very intimate relationship between the main actor and the audience yes um you know and it's it's cons conspiratorial isn't it really yes. and kind of like yes. it just just you and i have got this this moment although i think sally did play with it didn't she in in, in other episodes where uh, um um uh, and walker's character said you know who, who's it you're looking at you know where are you looking <laughs> right that was good yeah so it's very playful but, i mean again that's very that's very it's very sally wayne right you know to to be playful with things as well which is great yeah and you know i do want to say that um there's a whole other sort of meta level uh in that um ann lister looking at the camera that that conspiratorial quality that you're speaking of um, this show has had such a huge impact amongst gay women uh, and women across the LGBTQI uh, scale that, that that action of Ann Lister looking directly at us, yeah. it, as I said, it's a, a whole different meta level than you may yeah. even realize that you're hitting. I can, I, yeah, of course. I, yeah, I can believe it. Yeah, it's yeah, brilliant. Okay. brilliant. You've brilliant. never gotten to see that before. You know, yeah, bravo, Sally, if you're watching, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and well done, Matt, for catching it. Um, okay, uh, also, this is also from Leanne. Um, which of Ann Lister's walk and talks, the shots of her walking and talking to the camera, was the most difficult to shoot? How many takes did it take to get it right? And what camera setup proved to be the most efficient? Well, I mean, they were real, real challenges for our steady cam ops. So um, in the first block, that was uh, John Hember. In the second, it was um, Gareth Hughes. So it was, um, they, they were real, real challenges. All of them were actually, because they were it's so long and, you know, surround really went at a pace. Um, <laughs> you know, she wasn't hanging around. Um, I think they. I think all of them were a bit of a challenge. Is the truth, and the, and the longer they were, the more more of a challenge they, you know. And I think um, on other blocks they may have used a a rickshaw of some kind, mm. but certainly in my blocks they were, you know, the, the steady cam operator holding the camera and just going with her, you know, putting their kind of running shoes on and <laughs> keeping up with yeah, her. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Backwards very often. You know. Right. It's yeah. like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you know, she has to do that in high heels going backwards. So yeah, exactly. Same thing for your steady cam people. Um, from Lisa Joa and many others want to know: Were there any scenes filmed that you loved but weren't used? How much is left behind on the cutting room floor? Funnily enough, what's interesting is that until you kind of interrogate that, you you can't quite remember it, which is probably a good thing. That's a good suggestion of that the 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 piece works with you know without them but I do remember that sequence of of Anne Walker you know walking through the woods on her journey up to the, the hilltop um, because you know visually that I always I always like that because she's in that wonderful blue dress yeah. and she's stumbling you know so from a character point of view it's really interesting so she's she's gone on a, a long journey herself you know from where she just she's quite uh, cosseted um but here she is actually you know climbing up through the woods and you know stumbling up to the top so i do remember that and that didn't make it in which is a, which is, uh, is a shame um but you know the fact doesn't say that you can't quite remember the ones that, that probably suggests that the piece works and works yes. without them you know so yes uh, although and now that you've told me about it i can understand that you, in the power that could have had just in terms of Ann Walker's own journey, because we talk a lot about within the Gentleman Jack community, we talk about how Ann Walker has often been left as this non-entity in the Ann Lister story, when in fact, she's the one that left her family and said, screw you to the rest of Halifax and moved in with Ann Lister. You know, that was yeah. a small thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, yeah. And very often it's time, you know, I mean, the, the delivery on a you know, terrestrial show, um, you know, you've got to hit a very tight marker in terms of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the BBC's delivery is, you know, you've got to deliver somewhere between kind of 58 and 59 minutes, mm. you know, so that you're shooting an arrow at a very tight target. 
-huh. it's not like a film a film can you know between 90 minutes or three hours you know it can expand and contract accordingly but with a television terrestrial television show you're, yes. you're delivering so you are constantly aware not only of the time it's taking to film things but also the the story time you know so you, even when you're constructing like single takes yes for example they've got to be able to be you know expanded or contracted or or, 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 or the, the time has got to be allowed for them so yeah. that you can tell the story that you've got within the time you've got to tell it you see? Yeah. that's why scenes go and that and that brings me all the way back to your comment in the very beginning about sally's writing which is so economical and mm. yet manages to bring all of this together yeah uh, absolutely really phenomenal job i mean the first time i watched gentleman jack it wasn't just the story that captured me it was the writing i was blown away by the writing it just absolutely it was a master class yeah uh, this is from patricia book do the actors <laughs> have input in your shooting choices shooting choices well i mean obviously they've got huge input in terms of their you know their, uh, there's constant dialogue between um them and sally i mean what what was beautiful was that you know sally was the creator and writer and the director on the box i did so that meant that if there's any discussion about you know what you know a scene they could go to sally and sally would not only be able to tell them you know you know how she conceived it in terms of the writing but you know also the history of you know where she extracted it from in relation to the diaries you know right. so yeah. that was really valuable for the actors to have that um because obviously that doesn't always happen sometimes you're working with a director and the conversations with the writer are happening um maybe at the end of a phone call so wow. so that was great from that point of view and yes they they would have input in terms of you know whatever you're doing in terms of the camera and the, the what you're you know how you're choosing to describe the world uh, it's got to work for the actors as well you know yeah you can't yeah. just say well can you can you go over to the window because that's where the light's great you know there, there's there's got to be a truth in why they would go over to the window in the first place you know so that comes down to the the blocking that sally would do with the actors and you know so all those kind of discussions you know it's got to feel truthful for the for the actors as well you know so yeah really fascinating short answer is probably yes <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, this is from Livia. Can you talk about shooting outside the show me air? Outside shots like a fairy tale, inside shots, intimate and magical. What were the constraints like? Well, the show me air um, sequence was, was in a different block. I think that was in Nick Dance's block. Um, okay. But we did do, I think I did the interiors for a variety of reasons. So I think they, it was a, a slight readjustment. Um, so I think we went back and did the interiors, hmm. or some of the interiors, um, because I think it was a slight um, shuffle in terms of some of the design interior. Um, so yeah, I think they, the, the idea there was that it was meant to be this uh, strange, uh, you know, fairy tale like um moment yeah existed in the in the uh, in the woods well, uh, and then obviously became this private intimate space inside I, you know so i have to say when you first when the, the show me air first shows up on screen i'm almost waiting for like you know some little pixie to be you know cartoon to be flying around the top because that's how fairy taleish it felt but which was wonderful yeah. by the way mm -hmm. um <laughs> We talked about the birthday ball. What shot are you most proud of and what was the most fun scene to shoot? Well, I think the 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 arrival scene was was great fun. It it was it was great fun because you know I still get a kick uh you know I've been doing this in the cameraman for 30 years, I've been doing drama for 20 years, so I still get a kick out of walking on set and seeing what the art department have done to turn yeah. a location into a real world space and you know there's kind of meat stalls out and everybody's in costume you know and there's horses there it, it is 
it is great fun you know that those 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 kind of moments are great and then we we had a we had a good couple of days working on it they're busy and, and they you know they're, they're, they're hard work but they they are great fun and so all those kind of set pieces um great it was great in in copenhagen as well we had a, a really good time out there that was good towards the end of the the production so that was good um yeah so you know so many days actually so many days and and just having that opportunity say lighting and operating having the privilege of, of capturing um being there close seeing performers right right is, is, right. A, I just, is a real privilege it's just great it's great front row seat absolutely yeah absolutely. so we have, I have one more question for you uh this is from beth donald uh were there scenes shot with drones oh yeah i mean you know we, we had um uh, Halo View, who are a local uh, drone company, um, and um, uh, Darren and Phil, brilliant job they did. Um, and actually, it was interesting with, say, someone like Shipton Hall. Shipton Hall is quite difficult to describe as a location from the ground because, because of the geography there. Um, you know, one at one angle it would look a certain way, and then you come around, and then you know it's got these kind of high walls, and and it wasn't until we flew the drone above it that you suddenly got a sense of what the location was like. So, yes. you know, the drone as a as a as a modern tool is is fantastic. It, it allows us to give viewpoints and describe things that were quite hard to do before. You know. Yes. And um, yeah, so many. I mean, the 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 shot was one of my favourite shots actually, which was I think it was our first day, which was uh, Anne Lister's approach to um, Anne Walker's you know crow nest, and we're yeah. behind her coming under the trees. That was done on the drone. I think that may have been the first shot we did of the show. You know, that so it's like no pressure on uh, on Phil and Darren. There, you know, it's wow. great. Yeah, I didn't and, realize that was a drone shot. You know. Yeah. And Saran, Saran talked about that when she joined us with Sally, uh, that um, just before she was, you know, just before she got go, Sally said, I want you to twirl the cane. And Saran said, I never twirled a cane in my life. Yeah. And there she that was. was that was definitely a kind of a, a spine tingling moment from the point of view, you know, you're watching it on, on, the, on the monitors and you're just thinking, wow, that is, that's great. That's yeah. great. You know, and then there's a steady cam. Um, pull in front of her, which resolves to her um, outside, uh, and then you know she tips her hat with the cane. Right. And you remember, just, I just remember thinking, yeah, Saran is definitely she's found it. She's inhabited it. You know, she's she's working with Tom's wonderful costumes and the silhouette that he's created. Yeah. And uh, so that's definitely a moment, you know, because um, you put. As I say, you, you're working towards these moments, and you do hope that things kind of begin to fire in front of the lens. And uh, yeah, so in terms of drones, loads of drones, loads of drone work, which has allowed us to kind of open it out and expand the, the universe of the story and also describe this wonderful Halifax countryside, this mm -hmm. Yorkshire countryside, which uh, is Gorgeous. incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's, really, it's, really it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you, you just brought up something that I really would like to close with, which is you, thank you for your wonderful work on the show. And I, I, as far as Saran inhabiting the character, I still maintain that it's Ann Lister inhabiting Saran because yeah. what a marriage. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Really Absolutely, well done. Yeah. And thank you so much for the beautiful work that you did on Gentleman Jack Matt. And it's been just such it was a pleasure. pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, no, it was great. It was great. It was absolute pleasure and, 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 a, and, a, and a wonderful team, fantastic team. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you. And um, we're going to be dropping you off now. And as I said, it's rather abrupt, but thank you so much. <clears throat> so Matt has now gone back to his real world and here we are. And um, I just want to remind you <clears throat> that we do, excuse me, <clears throat> we do have uh, a whole raft of ALBW lives coming up between now and July. Uh, we'll be setting a schedule for you so you can see what those are in the very near future. Uh, in the meantime, um, I want to thank my team once again, and I also want to say to all of you, uh, thanks so much for watching. Please take good care of yourself. Please stay safe and wear a mask. <laughs>